This week, I'm delighted to be joined by Phil Rosenberg, who, in addition to being a senior director at a leading PR firm, uh, is the newly elected president of the Board of Deputies. Uh, Phil was elected in May. Uh, in his 16 years at the board, he's been a deputy, of course, uh, and an interfaith officer, and the director of public affairs, which was a position that he held for nine years. So, Phil, thank you for joining us and welcome. Mazalta, on your election, how, how does it how does it feel? Uh, it's a huge honour, a huge privilege, and a huge responsibility. You know, um, standing on the shoulders of giants, really. And you know, I've, I've worked with the last four presidents: uh, Marie, Jonathan, Vivian, Henry. Uh, but to be kind of in that line of de- descent, as it were, from Moses Montefiore, is, is a really amazing thing to be part of. You know, the board was founded in 1760, and is actually we're coming up to the Fourth of July. Uh, is older than the United States of America at uh, 264 years, and it's, it's, it's an amazing legacy to, to be part of. Well, thankfully, the uh, board election, uh, presidential election campaign was slightly less colourful than the one we're <laughs> yes, only witnessing on the other side of the Atlantic. Um, anyway, I just wanted to cover some uh, a few broad topics um, with, with you. But before, before we do, you know, the, the world into which you've been elected, the post-October the 7th world, is very different from the one that we've known until that, until October the 7th. Um, what's your feeling about where the community is at now? And do you have a vision about, under your leadership, where you want to take the board and, to some extent, the community? Yes. Well, clearly we're at an inflection point. The world since 7th October has... We've really been operating in the shadow of 7th of October for, for the last nine months. And whether that's the Israel's war of defense against Hamas or the massive rise in anti-Semitism, this is something that we're all grappling with in, in different ways. Um, I want to focus the board on five key missions to make sure that our mission is absolutely clear. One, fight anti-Semitism. Two, stand up for peace and security for Israel and the Middle East. Three, defend our religious freedoms. Four, make our community more united, more inclusive and more outward looking. And five, celebrate our faith, heritage and culture as British Jews. And I think we need to be absolutely clear about all of those things, that, that that's what we, we stand for and, and that's what we prioritise. Um, you know, it is tough. And, you know, speaking to different communities around the country, as I have been over the last few weeks, you know, there are real challenges. Things feel different in different places and some in some places it's more acute. But, you know, we as a community have resilience in our DNA and I'm confident that we will come back stronger. And that's what I'm determined that we do. OK, well, in terms of uh, the community as a whole, let's talk about diversity, uh, a topic mm. I don't normally talk about. Um, the, you know, the, the, the fourth of your five commitments was about inclusivity. Um, mm. And I think I believe the first statement that you released upon being elected uh, expressed some regret that you were a man and that um, all of the other vice presidents, that all the other vice presidents supporting you were also male and there was no women among them. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, for the first time in 15 years, the um, the honorary officers didn't include a, a single woman. And this is a challenge. Obviously, it was um, an open election. There were female candidates. Um, but this is um, the result that's been produced. And much as one could say, well, that's just a fluke in the past. There have been women present. In fact, my predecessor was a woman um, and so on. Actually, I do think that there are structural challenges in our community and in our organisation that, that we need to think about to make sure that we include all the talents. Um, there was a lot of work about 12 years ago, Commission on Women in Jewish Leadership, I think led by the Jewish Leadership Council, that, that really looked at this and actually quite a lot of work in terms of um, leadership development among women. And we had this, this uh, amount of time where actually we had a lot more women chief executives of Jewish organisations, women lay leaders. And I think probably a lot of us felt, well, you know, we've we've come over the top of the hill and you know, now we don't need to think about this anymore so much. Actually, probably what was happening was we were still on the way up the hill with our foot on the accelerator and we took our foot off before we'd reached the summit and actually now we're sliding back, back down. So one of the things I've done in the first month is produced a gender equality plan, which I'm consulting women deputies on. We, we had a meeting within the first days of my uh, term of office with women deputies to hear what their challenges were. A lot of things about the culture, uh, a lot of women, and I don't want to overgeneralise, but a lot of women felt that women, men will often push themselves forward and women sometimes need to be asked. So we're thinking about how we change the, the dynamic on that, how we improve the culture so it's less boorish and more inclusive, which, by the way, I think will be better for the men as well. 
Uh, and so we've got this uh, gender equality plan that we're currently consulting on and a series of ideas for how it is that we will change the board of deputies and hopefully model for the community and being more inclusive. Can I ask, how could you tell that the fact that all men were elected this time round, which is quite a, a difference from how it has been over the last 50 years, sure. how could you tell that this was indicative of a cultural backsliding and wasn't simply an anomalous moment. I mean, I know that when I, when I edit the paper, some weeks there are more women columnists, some weeks there are more male columnists, and it, it doesn't say anything really other than serendipity or, 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 or chance. How did you know? Why did you, what, what led you to think that this was indicative of a problem rather than just the run of things? I mean, it could be the run of things, but the reason I f felt that was I tried to encourage a number of women to stand, particularly for vice president. And... Um, a number of them said they wouldn't want to do that. And there are a number of re reasons that kind of came up repeatedly. The culture is toxic. It's too adversarial. It's, um, you know, it's, you know, the commitment is is not one that they could uh, could could utilize. And some might say, well, that's that's the gig. You know, if it, it's not for you, then it's not for you. But I think some of those things we can address and some of those things actually for men and for women, it will be healthier if we do address. So, you know, it's not to say you know everything is terrible actually let's learn from it let's make the board better i mean one of the things we speak about inclusivity we did that commission on racial inclusivity in the jewish community when i was director of public affairs the main finding really was that really essentially if you're welcoming and inclusive that's good for everyone in that case we were talking about black jews jews of color mizrahi jews and so there's all those recommendations there on that but actually here are two, the, some of the things that we're talking about that I think will improve the situation for uh, gender equality actually will work very well for men. So the board meeting on Sunday, we're changing quite a lot from the previous style. We're going to have an independent chair. Um, we're going to have an open forum for discussion as well as the questions to the president, which will change the style of the discussion from being only adversarial. Currently, deputies can only participate basically if they're asking a question and sometimes people ask soft questions but mainly a question infers something's not perfect or, and some you know and that's okay and there should be accountability and there will be we'll, we'll still have that but actually much more of the meeting should be people sharing their views so this this time obviously in the lead up to the election we're going to ask people to share their views of the challenges and opportunities in the next parliament that helps us to form our policy and to help think about how we engage with whatever the election produces. So on the on the note of the um, of the election, I, I do want to talk about the Commission on Racial Equality. But mm. so as you brought up the election, sure. um, you are a, a, a Labour, a Labour man. You're a Labour councillor during the Corbyn years, which mustn't must have been quite a challenge. Um, uh, your senior vice president, Adrian Cohen, is the chair of Labour Friends for Israel. Uh, the other vice president, Andrew Gilbert, is a member of the Jewish labour movement. Your treasurer, Ben Crown, is a member of the Jewish labour movement. Um, Jeremy Michelson, the one remaining vice president, uh, as far as I can tell, isn't a labour person, but I haven't looked into his soul. But, uh, you know, what are members of the community who are not labour affiliated or who, you know, or from, from the centre right or the right? What are they to make of this? Well, absolutely. I think, first of all, it's a, it's an important challenge and I think people have to judge us on, on what we do. I mean, my record, yes, I was a Labour councillor, but obviously I've been working in government relations for mostly under a Conservative government and achieved a lot of results with that Conservative government. So whether that's the prescription of Hamas and Hezbollah or working through Brexit or Covid from a Jewish community perspective, I think that my track record shows that I can work well with governments of, of all of all stripes, basically. And and what I really took as a compliment is I had endorsements during the campaign from Nick Timothy, who's obviously a previous chief of staff to Theresa May, um, Sam Coates, who was a previous uh, special advisor to Sajid Javid, and, and David Sumberg, who's a former Conservative MP, all of whom said, you know, obviously we know Phil's background, but actually he has such a good track record of working across part of the party and across the piece that... Uh, he's the person we would back. And I think that, to be fair of my of Adrian and Andrew, is pretty true as well. If you look at their record on the London Jewish Forum, you know, they've worked in under Labour administrations, but also under Conservative administrations and very constructively. And so, you know, I expect you and others uh, and, you know, the communities that hold us to account, we need to work across all parties. But I'm confident that what we do uh, will allow that. I think it's telling, you know, that, you know, this election, none of us hid our background. 
the deputies are quite diverse in terms of their politics and you know but actually i found a lot of the conservative leaning deputies were voting for me because they could understand that actually i was someone who would get things done and and you know will hear a diversity of perspectives i am keen that we make sure that conservatives and people who are conservative leaning feel that the board is for them uh, i'm doing some work around that as well to make sure that you know ultimately we have uh, a, a range of voices um but you know you'll have to judge us by by what we do right and I, I suppose that members of the community who are from the center right will will have an opportunity to get used to a labor majority uh not just in the board of deputies uh, over the next uh, few years um but also on, on that note the you mentioned the, the um commission for racial equality um this was the Commission on Racial Inclusivity, sorry, in the Jewish community yeah. from 2021, which was commissioned after the death of, uh, of George Floyd and the rise of Black Lives Matter. So it was at that cultural moment. Sure. Um, it made 119 recommendations, uh, including that Jewish schools must teach black history, slavery and colonialism. Mm. Security guards outside Jewish community centres and so on should stay away from racial profiling um, and that communal bodies should have regular listening exercises. I was looking at this just earlier and I noticed that the word black in this summary was was cap capitalised in the sort of American um, Black Lives Matter style. Mm. I just couldn't help but feel that Jewish members of the Jewish community who are on the right would be slightly left cold by it. They would they would call it woke, wouldn't they? They might. I mean, we did a we did a lot to try and include different parts of the community. And I think I was really pleased at the way people responded to it. I mean, obviously, Stephen Bush, a leading figure, leading journalist was was, you know, he led this with, I think, with exemplary clarity. And I think, I mean, we met with every key stakeholder group within the community and heard from them. Um, and I think, you know, um, people were welcome to debate it. He was always open to it being debated. He wasn't fussed that people would take issue with something or other in it. But actually, I think if you look at those recommendations in, in, in the whole and in the main, they support um, a, a more inclusive community. And I think, you know, I'm quite excited. Actually, I think we now have four black deputies, you know, which is which is remarkable, actually. And I've heard a number of um, black members of the community say that that commission changed their experience of the community. Obviously, it's not job done, but they said, you know, suddenly the way that they're tre treated by security guards changed. You know, they were treated with obviously professionalism and, and security is very important to our community we don't want to compromise on that but with more courtesy and more professionalism and that i'm sure is good for everybody um you know we're a minority community people might have said well you know by the last by the 2000 i think uh, and 11 census we were still dealing with then because i don't think the other one had, the results had not come out yet um the oh no there hadn't even been the 21 21 census by then the People might say, well, there's only 0.5% of the community who say that they're black Jews, so why does that matter? Well, that's a dangerous argument for the Jewish community, given that we're 0.5% of the wider society. And actually, I think that 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 doing this work on ourselves it will be in the interest of everybody. Of course, it wasn't only black Jews. Um, that was an important component, but also Jews of colour and Mizrahi Jews. And there's a really exciting element of that work, which speaks to this community that, yes, is very much part of it, us, and I'm the first part is roughly president of the board of deputies so that maybe that's uh, this has given me wings as well uh, we'll see but um you know that community and the the experience they had of persecution in the arab world and iran a story that's not often enough told i think is something that we do need to learn about so you know i think the commission has much to speak to uh, I, I think it would be great for us to kind of see all of those things implemented i know a number of them have been um but what, what i say to you is that the lived experience of black members of the community is improved since that commission. And I think that's that's a that, that's the most important barometer for it. Right. And uh, I suppose the last uh, element of diversity uh, with regard to regard to the board is is denominational diversity. Mm. Um, yes. The leadership is is dominated on the whole by orthodox um, left wing men. Um, do you, uh, your approach towards denominational harmony i mean we've had the reform and the progressive movements uniting haven't we mm. um in, in many ways we, we've had the, the, the orthodox movement taking its first steps towards female rabbis it feels to me there's a lot of um of of, of sort of convergence uh, more, or at least more than there was you know when i was a kid um what's your feeling about bringing the community further together without losing the distinction between the denominations 
Well, I think those, there are those differences still. But I, I mean, I think the starting point, and this is probably a good qualification for the role, is I love the Jewish community and I love it in all its diversity. And, you know, I spent the first morning of the role, the first working day in Stamford Hill with Haredi communities, which is a, a very important part of our community, the fastest growing part, thinking about how we better work together and across. And, and I think the, the Jewish Chronicle covered well some of the aspects of the Jewish manifesto we released that, that speak to particularly the things we were hearing from Haredi communities about their anxieties and, and hopes um, in the coming years. Um, but yes, yeah, so, you know, I've been busy out there. I, I was uh, at uh, the liberal Jewish synagogue for Shavuot, had a wonderful time judging the cheesecake competition. May, may, the, may my presidency be more about that than the, the difficult stuff, visited reform communities. Um, you know, the whole the whole spread of it is, is is a joy to me. And I think one of the things I'm looking really to be conscious about doing is bringing that community, bringing the community together. I think, and I've said this before, it's OK. We're a democratic organisation for us to disagree for the sake of heaven, the Shem Shemayim. Even better for us to agree, the Shem Shemayim. And I think actually there is so much on which we do agree. I mean, the reception of the Jewish Manifesto has been pretty positive. Uh, I'm sure not everyone agrees with every word, but people have said, you know, on the right and on the left, I see myself in this. I can, you know, I, I, I respect that. That's the careful work we have to do. And I'm sure we're going to get it wrong sometimes, but we really come with an attitude of let's bring people on this journey with us. Let's try and present as much as we can a united and cohesive community. Uh, by the way, one thing yeah. uh, before we move on from, I know you want to talk about other things, but one of the things that's really important to me and I'd love to do during this uh, training is to launch a commission on inclusion of di disability inclusion in the Jewish community. Mm. We have absolutely brilliant Jewish charities that work on this. And I think, you know, it's 20 percent of the, of the population has a disability of some kind and lots of good stuff is happening in the community. But actually, if we can work on including that section of the community, you know, that's that's a huge jump forward for us. So, yeah, I, 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 I'm, you know, across politics, gender, um, disability, race, I, the more we can make our community more united and inclusive, the stronger we're going to be. Yeah, in fact, the chief rabbi I know is also feels strongly about being inclusive on that score in terms of disability, yeah. inclu including single parents and other people Absolutely. who might find themselves on the margins and making them feel welcome at, at shul and, and, and in the community at large. But this brings me a little bit actually onto our next topic, which is uh, interfaith. Um, mm. I interviewed the chief rabbi in January um, in the aftermath of October the 7th, which is, of course, still where we are, frankly. Um, and he talked a, a fair bit, uh, fairly candidly, about interfaith, uh, about how he regrets the way that interfaith had been played out in the years preceding October the 7th, in that it often, in the enthusiasm to focus on um, things that united Jews and Muslims and, and the commonalities, Israel became the elephant in the room, that the Jewish path participants were not brave enough in bringing up and uh, and rooting out or being uh, intolerant of intolerance towards Israel, uh, thereby allowing the Muslim the Muslim partners to retain this Israelophobia, this anti-Semitism, mm. without being challenged. And uh, and we've seen an explosion of that since October the seventh. And the chief rabbi said that we need to be brave. Let's discuss discuss Israel. Um, what are your thoughts on that as somebody who's been deeply involved with interfaith in your time at the Board of Deputies so far? Yeah, no, no, I mean, I agree absolutely. So I've been involved in interfaith for about 20 years and I studied Hebrew and Arabic at university and was active in Muslim-Jewish dialogue. But from then, and it's been from then, I felt Israel always had to be part of the conversation for exactly that reason. If you don't involve discussions about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, you're not dealing with the thing that's potentially so divisive. So what I did whilst there at university, and it's something I've modelled in my later interfaith work as well, is I would say, look, it shouldn't be the only thing we talk about, but every term, one of the things we talk about will be the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And I built ways of discussing it that were really brilliant and constructive. I mean, they were really, really high quality conversations. We had Arab participants who were visiting students from Saudi Arabia joining these conversations, saying the most, it was, a re it was you know, obviously people didn't agree but I, I think one of the things that you, you can come to is that actually when the conversation is is mediated correctly, there is a, actually a lot of agreement on the question of, you know, human suffering, the lack of human potential and the frustration about, you know, the violence that, you know, both is, you know, that Israelis are experiencing and the, the suffering that, frankly, we see the Palestinians in Gaza, innocent Palestinians too being caught up um, for the misdeeds of, of Hamas and um 
we, we if those of us who, who who are invested in this world want to see a way of breaking the cycle um for the good of israelis and palestinians and and uh, you know to start with so i think that it's important we do have the conversation i think we might find that if we have it in the right way we find that there's more in common naturally what I strongly believe in this is something that Lord Sachs um, said uh, when he was chief rabbi is that we should really aspire in this country not to import conflict, but to export peace. But you're right to say that we can't do that unless we acknowledge the challenge. That's to say it shouldn't be the only thing we talk about. You know, I, to, to be able to come to the Israeli-Palestinian dialogue that I, I used to do, you had to come to some other sessions on some other things just so that people had something of a relationship to start with so that they didn't just see each other through the prism of that conflict. Well, Even though that was like, absolutely inessential. It just feels like, particularly since October the 7th, the Israel, Israel-Palestine conflict has become a single focus point of the prism of so many different social complexities. You know, kids who are on the streets uh, of London on a Saturday, uh, you know, fighting with the police or, or chanting genocidal slogans or whatever it may be. Mm. I feel often it's, they don't really know which river and which sea. It's a matter of being in some way anti-establishment um, it's it's sort of uh, using Israel and Palestine as a sort of ventriloquist dummy for other concerns. And it's become oh, people who are, who are radical on race, who are radical on gender, who are radical on the climate, often now focus that through Israel-Palestine. So it's become this sort of uh, what Hadley Freeman in our paper recently called the, the omni-cause. You know, the, the single yes, cause I thought that was a, all these others. Well phrased. Um, I mean, I know that uh, you're at uh, university with Mikdad Versi from the Muslim Council of Britain, which is a, an organisation which um, the government has a no engagement policy with. And yet they seem to have mirrored mm -hmm. the board's approach in some ways. You've got 10 commitments for the general election in your manifesto. They've also got 10 commitments in theirs. But then there are other groups. I mean, you know, I'm a huge fan of I mean, I, of engaging with moderate Muslims who are on side with us. And I interview some of them on this podcast, have them in my paper. Yeah. There are friends and cousins and brothers, and it's wonderful. There are many of them in Israel, by the way, as well as elsewhere. But it's, um, sure. it's but what do you do about finding the right partners for peace? I mean, and presumably you can't just talk to people who agree with you on Israel. You have to reach out further as well to change hearts and minds. That's absolutely right. I mean, I think extremism and Islamist extremism are one of the biggest pressing challenges of our day. And I say that not just for Israel and not just for Jews, but for our society and for our civilization. And when I say for our civilization, I don't mean in Huntingdon's Islam against the West. I think Muslims are on the front line of this challenge as well. If you think about who ISIS kills more of than anyone else, it's, it's Muslims. Who is Iran killing more than anyone else? It's Muslims. Who is Hezbollah massacring in Syria? It's Muslims. Who is Hamas killing day by day when it's not killing Jews, it's killing Muslims and, you know, certainly endangering Palestinians through the way that it's prosecuting this wicked uh, assault that it's done and the, the war that's fought subsequently. And if you think about, you know, the, the perverts who are trying to radicalise and groom Muslim young people, they're the victims of that. And the, the rise of the far right, which comes in response to the Muslims on the front line of. So we really do need Muslim leadership to stand up. but We need to support Muslims to do that. I had this very formative experience and I, it's not the only time I've experienced this, but during the presidential campaign I ran, I was invited to a, a mosque, uh, my local mosque, um, for an iftar, which is very nice. And I didn't know this at the time, but actually Sadiq Khan was coming. I know him a little bit. Uh, and we, when we saw each other, we greeted each other very warmly. And I was in Ramadan Barak, and this was caught on a on on film, and I shared it, and he shared it. Now that's maybe what interface should look like, but uh, the challenge was that an Islamist extremist group then sort of took that clip and said, you know, the Zionist Phil Rosenberg wants to be president of the genocidal board of deputies. You know, was invited to this mosque. Sadiq Khan should be ashamed for for engaging with this man and, and the mosque leadership should be run out of town. And they actually started stirring up hatred inside the mosque. They were talking about doing a demonstration outside. This is where you see moderate Muslims who are doing the right thing and building relationships being attacked by extremist organizations. And it really, for me, was, was the formulation of what we need to do. We need to strengthen the moderates and we need to crush those extremist groups. And that's why, for example, in the Jewish Manifesto, we talk about the need to really take action, not just, as we've said for a while, on groups like the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps of Iran and Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade and, uh, and, and the PFLP, groups that you know, really should be prescribed, but also, and in other space, groups like Five Pillars, who are sowing dis, you know, disharmony between communities. We need to see, a t we, whoever's the next government, we need to see tough action on this, and, uh, because it, it's disintegrating our society. It, it means that these, while there is not a, such a strong Muslim leadership 
currently. The voices that dominate are your five pillars, are your cages, are your men's. And that's a real problem. We need to work with the government to, to support moderate Muslims in pushing back and creating the space where actually that moderate voice emerges, which will be good, as I say, not just for Jews, but for Muslims and for wider society. And one thing that gives me a little bit of hope is this. After I was elected, 30 or 40 Muslim leaders have written to me uh, from every spectrum, from Sunni, Shia, from conservative to liberal, uh, across the country, people I have worked with one way or another, uh, and, and congratulating many of them publicly. And I think that there is therefore an opportunity to build what I call an optimistic alliance, to fight extremism, yes, to fight anti-Semitism and, and Islamophobia, to defend religious freedoms that are in common to us, whether that's halal or kosher, and to build the society we want, whether that's you know tackling poverty and the cost of living crisis or other things that are good for the society. And by the way, and I've had many conversations since being elected, with Muslim leaders, they are on board. They are on board for this. So we've got to get this right. If we don't get it right, we're all in trouble. But this is what I'm hoping to do. Now, moving on from extremists in other communities, how about those radicals and extremists in our own? Um, <clears throat> I'm thinking in particular of those on the hard left. Uh, we did an interview in the Jewish Country Jewish Chronicle uh, with uh, Zach Polanski, the deputy leader of the Green Party. And I'm not calling him an extremist, just to be absolutely clear about that. Mm. But he's definitely from the radical left. Uh, and he said in the interview that he thought that the Board of Deputies um, should be renamed the Board of Deputies for the Israeli government, because the board, board is, in his view, too pro-Israel, and he's obviously from a, a, a radical fringe. Um, there are... You know, so did he say he said that did he or, that's what sorry. he said that's what he said to him. okay yeah fine yeah yeah, yeah. Now, not fine but well i mean he you know he's representative of a radical fringe in the community and we see them sometimes at the pro-palestinian yeah. surrounded by genocidal slogans and and marching uh, uh, you know uh, against the interests of their own community what are your thoughts about the radical fringe on our own community uh, and your i mean your, your strategy towards I mean, I, I mean, do you have a strategy towards bringing them in, or do you, are you going to ignore them? Or I mean, what, what's your feeling about the fringes of our community? Well, it's a, it's an interesting. One. I mean, the Jewish Chronicle reported, and I thought it was really interesting that the day I was elected, Natamod released a statement saying the Board of Deputies doesn't speak for us. And I thought, well, I haven't said anything yet. How do you know? And there are some people who define themselves in opposition to the community, regardless of what actually the community is saying. I thought, you know, wait for me to say something, then oppose it, by all means. But, you know, I, I'm, I'm open to that. But that was, I thought, quite telling. I, I actually saw something similar on one particular right wing group tried to do something similar. I said, you know, wait for me to say something, then, you know, by all means. Um, so there are some people who just frame themselves in opposition. And I think we should see that for what it is. And I thought it was very good that the, the paper covered that, if I may say. So I, th I think it, was, it exposed what, what's going on here. Look, I think, um, as I said, I, I'm I'm very comfortable with a diversity of opinion. I am happy to have a debate, you know, with, with most sections of the community. I think it's OK to disagree, Lashem Shemayam, as I said, but better to agree. And on Israel, which one might say is one of the more divisive issues, I think there's a lot we do agree on, whether it's getting the hostages released and rescued, getting them rescued and released, uh, whether it's pushing back against the extremists of Iran, and I think the paper's done a lot of good work to expose some of that, uh, you know, and its proxies, whether that's Hamas or Hezbollah, or ILGC, or the other groups that we've spoken about, or whether it's um, whether it's pursuing that elusive peace with Palestinians and expanding the Abraham Accords. I think most of the community wants to see those things, and I'd like to try and bring people together in that direction. So, look, I think most people come on board. Of course, there'll always be people at the fringes, uh, who, who won't agree and, you know, we might have to say we respectfully disagree. But my hope is that we will bring together a much broader section than we have done in the past by saying these are things that we all agree on. So let's push forward in strength on them. Now, the, <clears throat> the final thing I wanted to ask you about was the Jewish Leadership Council, the JLC. Mm. Um, the board helped set it up 20 years ago, of course. Um, but there's been some changes, haven't there? The JLC... Um, is planning to, as I understand it, remove the automatic seat on the trustee body for for the president of the board. So you'll be the first, you'll be the first president of the board of deputies not to have an auto automatic seat on the JLC's um, the JLC's trustee body. Um, what what do you make of that? What does it mean? Just unpack it for our for our listeners and and just describe how you see the relationship with the JLC continuing uh, during your term. Sure. Well. 
I believe that we should merge the two organisations. I think, you know, the two organisations really have no substantive policy disagreements. There are some cultural differences, occasional tactical differences. But I think, you know, frankly, I think I go around the community and most people think it's a waste of time and money to have the two. So you think, so you, think think you think you should merge, but they're taking you off the board? Well, I, you know, <laughs> judge from that what you will. I mean, I, I think I think that um, I think that at a time of, of of crisis for our community, whether the war in Israel and and, and mass rise in anti-Semitism, I think that I don't know what they were trying to. I think that was the wrong thing to do. I say that with love and respect. I, I you know, but I can't speak to what was passed. I can speak to what's happening now, and I'm developing a very good relationship with Keith and with the JLC. We've you might have seen done a whole series of hustings together around the country to support the efforts of engaging our community in the general election. Thirty hustings actually, which which is. It's extraordinary. Many of the only hustings, in many cases, the only hustings that have taken place in constituencies at all have been the ones we've done with the JLC and local communities. So I want to model a different way of doing things, uh, coordination where we can. If we can get to a merger, that would be great. Um, I think that there's a good model for how we do that. It must be under democratic control, in my view. That's that's the thing that gives the board and the community the legitimacy to speak the way that we do. But look, there's a lot of good things going on in both organisations. If we could only harness them t together and make sure that we're speaking as strongly as we can together, then that's that's all to the good. And I'm really pleased with how the relationship is, is starting off. Uh, and let's see where we can take it. And just finally, uh, Phil, uh, I, I'm sure you haven't really given much thought to what life might be like after you've completed your term in office, however long that might be. Uh, what will it be? Labour peerage? MP? <laughs> Well, look, I want to, the main thing is that I released a manifesto during the uh, election with 43 pledges and I want to deliver all of them if I can. And that's the way I'll measure my success. Did I, did I, said, did I deliver what I set out to do? It's been in the first month pretty good. I mean, we've, you know, I said what I, I did, what I said I'd do on the first day, I did what I said I'd do in the first week. You know, we've done a lot to change the way the board works to begin to that more, the position of empowering deputies. I'm, I'm taking on staff to help us improve our campaigning ability as an organization which i think is crucial setting a new tone um developing new relationships trying to bring in people who are more to the right and more to the left into the board so I, i'm pretty pleased with how it's going but yes the, the measure of success is how i do against those pledges so um the prime minister phil rosenberg might be somewhere in the future uh don't don't wish that I mean, we've got we've got some other elections to get out of the way but the 43 the 43 pledges is where i focus now very good well phil thank you so much for joining us and um i'm sure the whole paper and the community joins me in wishing you the very best of luck perhaps in your endeavors uh, in, in everything that you do that you do thank you so much jake